what is going on everybody welcome back to the channel and thank you for clicking on this video so no way home is about to release we are less than a month away and since there's all this talk about the multiverse and how toby and andrew garfield might or might not show up but regardless if that's true or not i wanted to go and revisit sam raimi's spider-man and as well as the amazing spider-man just because we have all these spider-man coming together i mean come on we know it's true there ain't no doubt about it so let's go ahead and revisit 2002's spider-man what i really like about sam raimi's spider-man is that everybody in here is so fleshed out all the characters are so relatable they feel very much like your average people they don't feel as of just characters that are just written for the sake of the movie this is way before the mcu so you really feel the whole different vibe the different tone of the movies this was before the mcu was ever made it doesn't have that formula that a lot of the superhero films have now and it's not just the character of the hero that's written very well everybody's written like all the supporting characters and my uncle ben green goblin norman i mean willem dafoe as a green goblin the villain everybody this this is an almost picture perfect cast for this movie now honestly in my opinion this is the best superhero movie that's ever been done now you might disagree honestly but this in my opinion best hands down not just the better of the spider-man movies but just in general a very well done superhero film now in just with the opening scene just the very first scene that we get you get to see how bad peter's life sucks how much of a loser he is <laughs> hey stop the bus <laughs> that's me He's always running late and even the bus driver is over here laughing at him. And we see that MJ has, you know, deep down she really does care about the guy even though they don't really talk. But yeah, they've been neighbors since they were kids. Peter's life is so bad that other nerds are looking at him like, damn, I thought I had it bad, but looking at you... Don't even think about it. And it's because they don't even let him sit down. This Look at this ugly white girl over here. He, she doesn't even want to let him sit down. He's over here feeling privileged just because he has it so bad that she's like, you know what? You you are their focus. That way it takes the focus off of me. Look at the black dude in the back is like laughing at him like, yeah, white boy, get back to the back of the bus. Sorry, man. Peter obviously only has one friend, his one loyal friend that sticks with him. That's Harry Osborn. You would think that Peter knows Norman personally by now, but this is their first time meeting and Norman finds out that he's actually really smart. Yes, I, I wrote a paper on it. Impressive. Your parents must be very proud. The way that Norman looks at Harry as he says, wow, you know, that's impressive. Like, you see Harry, why, why do you have to be this stupid? So the high school class is going on a field trip, but as you're seeing Peter getting bullied, as we see the character of MJ, like, in the background, we're just hearing the, the, the tour guide talking, and you can hardly understand what this lady's saying. Family Phyllis Tadiday, Janice Kukukania. I have no clue what the hell she just said right now, but it's obviously somewhat important information because she's telling you what type of powers he's about to get. It's kind of a piece of exposition in a way you could say. Man, does this scene give Columbia University some bad reputation because it's letting you know that they are probably one of the top ranking schools or universities and they just can't keep track of their test subjects. I beg your pardon? One's missing. I guess the researchers are working on that one. I like how she says that with so much confidence. Like, uh, yeah, I, I guess they're, they're performing a test, but you know, we got it. See, Norman, he's the head of Oscorp. It's his company, and they've been assigned to make performance enhancers for the military. I didn't understand this at first. It's something that as a kid, you kind of don't, don't even pay attention because you just want to see, you know, you just want to watch some action and stuff. But as you rewatch it, when you get older, I started to understand more. And pretty much it's as if they're making a serum, a super soldier serum. It's not called that. They're just called performance enhancers for the military. But it's pretty much that when you think about it. And then this formula is not working. They keep having to go back and, you know, just improve their testing, their developing or whatever. All this science crap. And these and these guys that are in charge of the funding, they, they don't like Norman. They, they just want to get him out. So if these enhancers are not done in time. They're going to give their funding to some other company. And they are very much well leaning towards that because they just hate Norman with a passion. They just want him out. So there's not enough time. So Norman takes it upon himself to test the enhancer on himself. And as it is explained in this scene, the reason why the enhancer is not ready because a lot of test subjects were having some side effects and those included 
violence, aggression, insanity, and that's why the Green Goblin is just crazy and just a lunatic. Meanwhile, at the same time, Peter's going through his change as well. He gets bit, he goes home, he's not feeling well. He looks like he's just anorexic. He's so skinny, he's so scrawny, and then he starts like passing out. It, and this scene, it just looks like he has COVID. Another scene that you just let slide is when he's at school and the first time that his webbing comes out, it's weird how it shoots out and into this lunch tray at a table in the cafeteria at school and there's people literally right there and nobody, nobody notices that there's literally a huge strand of web coming out of Peter. Nobody notices and nobody even cares when he gets up and he starts running away because he's freaking, he's freaking out and, but it's like, okay, no one knows. Spider-Man's not in the picture yet, but after he became Spider-Man, wouldn't you think, I would assume some students would be like, wait a minute, I remember that weird kid at school was running around with web attached to his lunch tray. The high school fight scene is actually one of my favorites. I love how whenever Peter's spider sense is going off, that sound effect that they add and how everything stops and the camera's just swinging around, just letting you know what Peter, he's just sensing everything around him. He, he's able to sense everything from the smallest thing to the biggest detail and he beats up Flash and it's so funny how Flash obviously nobody likes him but in this school at Midtown High not even the teachers like him. <laughs> this teacher was probably like, man what the hell with you Flash here take take that chocolate pudding but in this scene it actually took me a while to figure it even point it out it's that Peter's red and blue costume idea, this whole montage scene of when he's drawing out different possibilities, it actually comes from, if you really just look at it, it, it shows Mary Jane, her red hair, she's over there swinging her hair around, and then the blue car that he really wants to buy to impress her. And it took me a really long time to be like, wait, oh, it's the red hair and the blue car. And boy, do I feel stupid. And I just really love that little soundtrack that's playing as he's drawing. Is that classic Danny Elfman score mixed with a little electric guitar. Nice little touch to that. The way that Peter and Uncle Ben, they leave things, they're not on good terms. So it really hits him harder than as opposed to The Amazing Spider-Man, how they have an argument. Yes, I mean, that's not good terms at all, but... He really just doesn't say anything to Uncle Ben that hurts him. And those are the last words that he says. Not like this one. The last thing that he says to him, hey, you're not my father, so stop pretending to be. And it's like, ooh, I felt that. And speaking of perfect casting, I think it's the most perfect actor that was casted in this movie was J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. I mean, the guy, they, they nailed it with this one. It's comic book accurate, the way that he looks, everything from the hair, that voice, the way he talks. I could not think of anyone better to play J. Jonah Jameson. To me, everything's done really well. There's very good pacing. We see the nerdy kid that was just picked on, how he became this hero. He's not fully developed yet. You can even tell by the swinging. When he first starts swinging, into buildings through buildings as he's chasing to get uncle ben's killer his swing is not in a way stylized yet as it is later on he's still like very wobbly he's not very well balanced so that really shows a lot and i like that and once they graduate high school they're doing the thing he's trying to find a job everyone's working everyone's doing something and when there's this scene where i was watching it and where he runs into mary jane as she's working I like as a waitress at this cafe called Moondance. Funny enough, I was watching Tick Tick Boom with Andrew Garfield and that same, he works in that same cafe. So I was like, hmm, was that little Kent, little nod towards Sam Raimi's Spider-Man? And the tone of the movie just feels a lot better when they're out of high school because these actors were like in their late 20s, early 30s, somewhere around there. And obviously they don't look like high school. They're supposed to be seniors, but it doesn't, the tone of the movie feels a lot better. It fits a lot better when they're out of that because they fit the role of just playing their actual age group instead of high schoolers. So if this would have been a movie where Peter is not didn't start off in high school, but he started off, you know, any time after that, it, it would have fit even better for me. And you would think that after high school, all your troubles are over, that you're not going to deal with none of the BS that you did in school, but no. Harry is the worst best friend that you could ever have. I mean, talk about being a backstabber. He took 
Peter's dream girl, they started dating. He didn't even, nobody even told him. He had to find out through Mary Jane. We're going out, didn't he tell you? Oh yeah, right. What leads up to Norman's first attack or his first goblin flight or whatever is, is something that I guess I never really understood. The, he's having a meeting with all these board members from the company and then they tell him, yeah, we're selling the company. Sorry, you're out, you know, you're, you're gone, you're fired. But I'm like, if you're the CEO, aren't you, if you're the, cre you're the one behind, you're the mind behind this company. You started it, on, don't you have a say in it? And don't you have authority over everyone else? I don't know how these things work. Maybe it's my mind, lack of corporation knowledge, but never understood that. The World Unity Festival is also the first encounter with Goblin and Spider-Man. And it make, it, this brings up a good point of how this whole movie is, a lot of the things, all the action, a lot of just scenes in here in general are in camera. There's not a lot of CGI. There is some, but it's not overly used. And that's also one of, like a huge positive for me because especially nowadays everything is cgi everything it's not even filmed on location anymore i mean hardly ever and in this festival scene if i remember like it was yesterday i was watching it we were in the movie theaters and when spider-man rescues mj and they're swinging away as this beautiful score is playing and he's swinging her to safety people in the movie theater were literally clapping they stood up and i'm like bro like the, the movie's not even over yet hold on chill but I mean, I ain't gonna lie, I was clapping in there too. I was happy. But it was a very nostalgic moment. You literally, I, I got goosebumps. And just to enjoy Harry's confusion, Peter's over there laughing. He's enjoying him watching Harry being confused because he's over there talking on the phone with MJ and she's telling him how amazing Spider-Man is. And Harry's over here thinking that she has sex with Spider-Man. What do you mean he's incredible? No, all right, wait, stay there. I'm gonna come over. Got he. You know, deep inside, Peter's probably like, damn, I knew I should have. You know, at first, Harry was never the type of guy to show off his wealth. He dressed very casually. He, he didn't put it out like that. But then once he has a girl, once he has MJ, he was like, let me buy you something because I got money. But then when, when you really think about it, Goblin's plan is never really clear. When he makes a proposal to Spider-Man telling him, hey, join me. But when you watch it, I'm like join you for what like what are you planning all he says is like yeah imagine what we could create you and i you know we could be a partnership we could be teams like okay so what are you trying to do and i admire peter because at this point in his life he doesn't let whatever's going around him take him away from still trying to get the girl even when he's flat broke that does not stop him from offering mj to take her off for a burger i'd like a cheeseburger Oh, but I'm going out to dinner with Harry. You could tell Harry's just like a very heavy burden on her. She's like, oh, I gotta go to dinner, damn. And Peter even goes ahead and asks her, so how, how are things going with, with Harry? And she's like, uh, and he's like, oh, never mind, you know what? That ain't none of my business. And then she's like asking him if it's not, then why do you care so much? She she puts him against the wall and then Peter's, Peter's goofiness comes out. I mean, we... If you think that he was all grown up, mature, no, he's still the same goofy kid deep inside because his response is hilarious. I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. That's something a goofy person would. That's something I think I would say if I was put against the wall. Like, damn, she really, she just made me look stupid right now. Like, come on, Peter, she's giving you the hand. She's giving you that look. Like, she's pretty much telling you, hey, I know you care. Come on on and say it. Come on, I'll leave him right now. And like every superhero film, we gotta have a final battle scene. But this final battle is not something that just happens because it's part of a the structure of a superhero film. The way that it leads up, it's the way that it works really works well is because the villain, Goblin, uses Peter's personal life. There's a lot of personal motives behind everything. He really wants to put him against the wall saying, hey, you know what? I know who you are. I know what you're capable of. I know where you're most vulnerable. He gets MJ. He attacks his family. And just to add a little cherry on top, he grabs a bunch of kids, holds them hostage because he knows that he can't save, well, in his mind, he won't save both of them, but he knows that he, he'll, he if it was up to him, he'll just go for MJ when she's in danger. And this, what's really great about this last scene on the bridge is that it's not a whole back and forth, Spider-Man hitting Goblin back and forth. No, it's Spider-Man is just like hanging by a thread, literally, well, hanging by this last web. 
while Goblin does his thing. He's beating him up. Everybody's in danger. It's This last scene is just full of intense moments, full of suspense. And once it's down to one-on-one, Peter's just getting the crap kicked out of him. And Norman, Willem Dafoe does his thing. I don't, I don't even know if it's him or not, but Goblin does his thing where he does like a flying ninja kick. And it's obvious that he's on a wire. But it's just something that I thought it was funny how you could tell it's on a wire. But other than that, it's done really well. Everything's in camera, not a lot of CGI. Other than that explosion where he throws a pumpkin bomb and Peter is like right here in front of Peter's face. But do you die? No, because he's Spider-Man. Goblin dies. Peter feels like crap because it's his best friend's dad and there's no way he can tell him. And it ends at this funeral and Peter is such a, he's such a G, he's such a savage that he goes to the funeral it's Harry's dad's funeral. He's over there trying to show sympathy, pay his respects, but he doesn't go just for that. He goes there to take MJ back. He makes out with her in front of Uncle Ben's grave. Like, hold on, Uncle. I, 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 I know I, I came here to reminisce, but I got to take care of some business. He takes Harry's girl back, makes out with her, and walks away like a G. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> he walks away, and that leads to, in my opinion, the best final swing out of all these Spider-Man movies. It's just classic. It's just very iconic as he's swinging through the city. We have that amazing musical score playing that whole opera thing that they do. I don't know. It's just something about it that makes you get goosebumps every time you watch it. It really takes you back. Every, it takes me back every time I watch it. And there's your movie. And again, in the movie theater, I remember people gave this a standing ovation. Once the credits started rolling, everyone was standing up. Everyone was cheering, throwing popcorn everywhere. It was hard to get a ticket for this movie. Everything was sold out. I had people having to wait till the next weekend because they, they didn't have a chance to watch it opening weekend. So that's how you know this, this movie was just big. And even though this movie is great, I do understand and I do realize that it has some flaws. I mean, we're kind of, it was 2002, we were coming out of this 90s cheese phase. I mean, you know, 90s were a little cheesy, you gotta admit that. It has some flaws, but overall, it's not something that brings downgrades the film. Because in the end, I will say that Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is and remains classic worthy. Instant classic! Genius, genius, genius! But I want to know from you, what are your thoughts on Sam Raimi's Spider-Man? Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. And before I go, I will be having some Spider-Man movie trivia. If I get enough participants, I will host a movie trivia through Zoom. So if you want to join and you have a chance to win some prizes and as well some cash money, if you get all the questions right, I will be giving out some money. What better way to end the year with a bit of free money? I mean, why not? Whatever cash transferring app you use, I can go ahead and send that your way and also be giving out little cool prizes like I have this little cool Spider-Man cell phone holder for your car. A nice little mini Spider-Man figure to put on your desk or wherever, wherever you wanted to decorate. I have this cool shot looking glass. It looks like a shot glass. I mean, you don't even have to drink. It's just the fact that it just looks great. And if you're looking to smell good, that you can also get yourself some Spider-Man body spray. That's right. There is some Spider-Man body spray out there. So if you want to go ahead and join, then go ahead and like this video. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Instagram. Shoot me a DM with your name and email. And I'll go ahead and add you to the list. And we get enough participants and we can go ahead and do this virtual Zoom movie trivia. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. Keep watching this channel and keep watching movies.